Greetings, I'm John the Spirit. I'm Arch Ezekiel. We have so much power and so many things we could do with it, and welcome to Sky Greg Super Shorts. We needed to make some changes to our electric blast furnace parallelization system because Laser IO for some reason wasn't round robining correctly. Even though we said force round robin, goddammit. It was doing fine with the items, it just was having trouble round robining the fluids in the precise amounts we'd asked it to. So we are now using stocking cards for the fluids and pulling in the exact amount required for any given recipe. More accurately, double the exact amount required for any given recipe. Since all our recipes come into the blast furnace system in multiples of eight, and there are eight blast furnaces, and there are four fluid input hatches for the blast furnaces, we need to make sure we put double the fluid amount of any given recipe into the hatches. What this means is that if a recipe inserts eight buckets of, for example, nitrogen gas into this little subnet, each of these fluid input hatches will end up with 2,000 nitrogen. Hopefully. There's room for error here, since the EBFs do start immediately upon getting all their ingredients, so there's a small chance that a laser node could grab two, three buckets of nitrogen into the input hatch because one of them is used. But because, question mark, question mark, question mark, they'll all run at once, Hopefully they'll collect exactly the right amount. It was stress, significantly stress-tested, stress and we believe it works um, with no hitches. If you want to know just how stress-tested, you should see that we have 661 stainless steel in this AE terminal, whereas before this EBF we had about zero. It took like less than two hours to get all of that stainless steel, probably more like an hour. We're now running the system on 200 steel, and you'll notice that the wrought iron is basically being evenly distributed. Each of these input hatches has the correct amount of oxygen gas. This bronze drum is stocked pretty full of oxygen gas. But theoretically, by the time this is done, the drum should be completely empty, and so should every single LB input hatch. The craft is already almost done. It's only taken, uh, like, 10 to 20 seconds. And we can see that all the LB input hatches have completely emptied, and so have the buses. Wonderful. How are we powering this, you ask? Well, we're still powering it with setting boosted diesel, but in the last episode, while we did get screw you power, we now also have fuck you power. In the form of gasoline. When I first calculated this system, I planned to be able to take the extra naphtha and refinery gas and turn it into gasoline using the raw gasoline recipe, which takes those two items. Since we already had an acetic acid and methanol um, infrastructure made for the setane boosted diesel, one of the only weird requirements was acetone, which requires acetic acid in a large chemical reactor under program circuit 24, which is what this left chemical reactor is for. It also requires a catalyst of quicklime, which is thankfully not consumed because it seemed terrible to make. You just stick it in. The most convenient way to get it was to turn 5 calcite dust into 2 quicklime dust, and calcite you can of course get by smelting calcite ore. The amount of acetic acid we need to run both the gasoline system and the diesel system ended up being more than, I think, an LV chemical reactor, so I needed to make an MV chemical reactor for the acetic acid, which hopefully is enough for both systems, but I'm not sure. But anyway, once you have acetone, methanol, refinery gas, and naphtha, you can make your raw gasoline at very large rates. One thing worth noting is that LV output hatches only contain 16 buckets of fluid, but the recipe makes 20 gasoline, so in order to protect your gasoline, you need to put it in at least an MV output hatch of 32 buckets. I'm not sure what happens if you have insufficient space for both. The last thing worth noting is that the acetone recipe makes oxygen, so we need two output hatches, and we need a fluid trash can with a storage bus on it so that this subnet can do its thing. Honestly, fluid handling with AU2 is so good. If only these things didn't require so many pistons! Anyway, to turn raw gasoline into gasoline, you need toluene. In order to run our system, we needed toluene at a rate of 6.25 per tick. There are many ways to get toluene, but as it turns out, the highest return is from heavy fuel. But you may be thinking, Jonathan, aren't you using all of your heavy fuel, literally all of your heavy fuel, to make diesel? And while the answer to that question is yes, there are other ways to get heavy fuel. Which is why we have this absolute monstrosity of a build right here. Part of the reason it's a monstrosity is because Ender.io is terrible in this pack and all of our fluid distribution options seem bad other than Greg Tech pipes. And also we're bad at Greg Tech pipes. But this system uses three MV distilleries to turn heavy oil into sulfuric heavy fuel. The heavy oil is coming from a similar furnacing oil sands or centrifuging it for sand and heavy oil. Actually, I need to trash the sand or we'll instantly die. Okay, all the sand is gone now. 
Once we have all that sulfuric heavy fuel, we can put it into a chemical reactor with hydrogen to turn into heavy fuel, using the typical hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide electrolyzer system. We wanted to use the face between the electrolyzer and chemical reactor to swap both the hydrogen and the hydrogen sulfide, but it wasn't really working very well, so we just used a steel fluid pipe to pull out the hydrogen and put it back into the chemical reactor. Once we have the heavy fuel, we require a total of 12.5 MV distilleries to turn it into toluene. So we put down 13. There's three running off this MV line, which comes from a high amp MV transformer because we also need to power all these LV machines. And then there's five more surrounding each of two MV transformers in a flower pattern. To push the heavy fuel into all of these distilleries, we have filters on every distillery and a specific pipe network just for heavy fuel, which transports heavy fuel everywhere. Then, to get all of the toluene out, we have a system which is just for the toluene. Every distillery has an auto output into the system, but also disables fluid's input from the output side so toluene can't accidentally go into a distillery. Because as it turns out, toluene can go into distilleries and it turns into light fuel at a terrible rate. Okay, actually it's not that terrible, it's 30 to 30. That's kind of strange, but okay. Considering that there are three buckets of light fuel in this steel drum, we must have had some problems. But we're hopeful that disallowing input from outside on all of these distilleries will work just fine and that we haven't caused ourselves any other problems. Thank you, Greg Tech Pipes. Very cool. This toluene is connected to the A2 network and is used in the same large chemical reactor to make the final gasoline. The total gasoline we make, question mark, question mark, question mark, is 68.75 millibuckets per tick. Since each millibucket of gasoline is 1600 EU, this is exactly 110,000 EU per tick, which is 214 HV amps, which is 53 EV amps, which is 13 IV amps. Pretty damn good. That's why we call this kind of power, fuck you power. It's just too good to be true. Now that we have all this power, we want to do a lot of things with it, but that involves being able to make a lot of circuits. Now that we have all this power, we can automate circuits. In this pattern provider underneath an advanced bender, we are automating foils. We're also doubling up to automate plates as well. The way that you can do this is if you use plates to make foils, it uses the same program circuit. It takes a little more time, but it, require, it allows us to not make multiple benders. With our enormous amount of hydrochloric acid hooked up to the system, we could also automate iron 3 chloride in this advanced chemical reactor. And therefore automate um, plastic printed circuit boards from plastic circuit boards, copper foil, and iron 3 chloride. We're also using our precious new polytetrafluoroethylene in order to make the plastic circuit boards at a better rate. We just have so much of this stuff. You may have noticed that as of this recording, there are now 36 pattern slots in this extended pattern provider. For identical resources to making an extended pattern provider, you can upgrade a pattern provider to an extended pattern provider using the pattern provider upgrade. Since we're talking about circuits, what about Applied Energistics 2 circuits? Either GregTech or the authors of this mod pack have provided us with a GregTech multi-block called the Large Inscriber. Large Inscribers can make various processors from AU2 rapidly. They'll take either silicon dust or silicon, which is a major benefit because instead of having to autoclave AU2 silicon, we can just use the silicon dust that we already have from our air centrifuge system over here. Also, the machine is overclockable. In fact, as it happens, we're using a medium voltage 4x battery buffer and filling it with gasoline MV power so that we can use an MV transformer to run this multi-block at HV. We know we're going to run it infrequently enough that we can afford to do this. We're auto-supplying liquid redstone to the ULV input hatch, which is just redstone in a fluid extractor. And our MV input bus already has all four pressings. This should not cause any serious incompatibilities. It's just going to work. A couple things to be aware of, this machine requires at minimum an MV muffler hatch. It also requires an auto maintenance hatch, which while being more expensive than the normal M uh, maintenance hatches, will never need maintenance. It's just a meaningless block that sits there to do maintenance for the machine, I guess. But it has a cute green light. I'm now shoving patterns to use silicon dust and each of the individual ingredients to make each of the individual processors. Let's see if it works. We could stand to request, I don't know, 32 engineering processors. Oh, it's going. It's going real fast. And now that we have that, we can do a lot of automation. We've basically completely co-opted our MV machines for this. We have a mixer making glowstone because you need that to make patterns. An electrolyzer making manganese and tantalum for SMD components. 
The reason I'm saying this to you is because both of these recipes are actually the same, so why do we have two of them? If a recipe has more than one output, AE2 differentiates between the primary output and all secondary outputs. AE2 will request a recipe specifically only for its primary product. If it makes extra secondary products that are useful for the craft it's currently doing, that's neat, it's happy that it's doing that, and it will absorb that into its calculations. But for this recipe, it will never request manganese dust using this recipe, only ever tantalum dust. So if you wanted to still request manganese dust, you have to make it request manganese dust with the same recipe, but with the output cycled. In order to reuse a wire mill to make wires, we're doing the same trick that we pulled with a bender before. Fine wires can be made with normal wires at the same ratio to ingots. We are taxing this MV assembler heavily. It's set to circuit 8 so that it can make um, casings. But we're also using it to make all forms of cables, and probably motors and pistons too. But Jonathan, you ask, don't the MV motors require 2x carbonical wires? How are you going to make those with your wire mill not set to 2x? Well, you can always craft 1x wires together. It's only a convenience thing to use the um, wire mill on a different program circuit. We've also automated the lathe for several types of rods. And we've automated an HV polarizer, which is the highest polarizer we'll ever need for any recipes. Mainly because the neodymium rod magnetic requires it. Our HV assembler is making a bunch of SMD components. We're using the patterns at relatively high rates in order to use the fine wires effectively and not have a bunch of random wires in our system. We do intend to automate gallium soon, TM. This episode is running a bit long in the tooth, so I'm not sure if we'll actually see the gallium automation today. Just kidding, we're doing it now. We have like, three of these monstrosities. I mean, okay, given that we have made other things called monstrosities in this episode, I don't know if it's fair to call any of these monstrosities, but they are, I don't know, they're little monsters, little babies. These are individual ore processing systems whose goal is to make a variety of basic items you need for circuits, and also um, titanium. Here, sphalerite ore is forge hammered, and then ore washed with a program circuit of two, so it turns into purified sphalerite ore really quickly. We use uh, HV macerator to painstakingly macerate that purified sphalerite into purified piles and gallium dust. Gallium dust is imported using a cute little subnet into a dark oak drawer that stores the gallium. The purified piles of sphalerite go into the centrifuge where they make sphalerite and more gallium. And the sphalerite dust goes into the advanced electrolyzer to make sulfur dust and gallium. We get a cute zinc byproduct out of this, which we've used so that we could automate zinc foils and have item filters automated as well, which is nice. Because the storage bus for this drawer is on a subnet, we have another storage bus for the general network, but I did not follow that pattern when I made my system for boron. Boron is going to be needed for a variety of things. In particular, it helps us with the magnesium diboride, which is the superconductor of MV. Since we're automating a lot in MV, it doesn't seem like the worst idea to have a superconductor here, so we have minimal loss of power. Boron will also eventually be used to make borosilicate glass fibers, which are used in chemical baths to make reinforced epoxy resin sheets. Those are necessary for all of the quantum circuits. The system we use here is slightly more complicated. This MV macerator has a pattern which turns nether rock salt ore into 8 crushed rock salt. We are washing that crushed rock salt into purified rock salt using a general ore washer. This general ore washer is part of a general ore processing system whenever we need to forge hammer ores twice and then wash them to get their dusts out, which is what we do with nether aluminum ore. To be clear, if you forge hammer aluminum ore, you get crushed. If you forge hammer it again, you get impure piles, and then you can ore wash those with a program circuit of two to get your aluminum dust nice and fast. I just co-opted it so that I could purify my rock salt ore. Purified rock salt ore goes into this HV macerator where it makes both borax and purified pile of rock salt. Purified pile of rock salt also has the chance to make borax. The rock salt from the purified rock salt gets electrolyzed into chlorine and potassium. Potassium is nice because it makes sodium potassium, which is an ingredient for some energy hatches. Meanwhile, all of the borax goes into this electrolyzer, where it turns into sodium, boron, and some fluids we dump into a trash can. I'm saving our titanium setup for the next episode, because we were originally just going to make the rutile dust, but we realized, well, that's a secret for the next episode.
Because we were needing so many void upgrades, and because void upgrades and functional storage require obsidian, and because obsidian and fluid solidifier is terrible and takes 5 million years, we've set up a system involving an LV block breaker and a fluid flopper. A basic lava generator over a cupernickel coil generates lava for this steel drum so that we have lava in the system. We export that lava into a flopper. Floppers can place fluids in world, and that way we can get obsidian. Breaking the obsidian requires a basic block breaker, but the block breaker is very slow breaking obsidian, which makes sense, but it generates a horrendous amount of particles, which makes much less sense. This lags the world out rather intensely. In order to prevent this from happening, we use a ME threshold level emitter. Whenever there are less than 8 obsidian in the system, it'll turn off the redstone signal, and this machine controller currently disables the block breaker when it has a redstone signal on. So when the redstone signal turns off, the block breaker will start breaking. The obsidian will get imported into the system, and when there are above 16 obsidian in the system, the threshold level limiter will turn back on, turning off the block breaker. So every once in a while, when we make our void upgrades, we're probably going to get a brief moment um, where we'll have a bunch of lag while the block breaker tries desperately to break obsidian. Our final nice little fact, TM, is that we are importing liquid soldering alloy into this HV circuit assembler and using a pattern provider to make our three circuits. LV, MV, and HV. We have absolutely everything on our crafter for these except for the chips, because I have told Arch that I don't want to make chips until we have the IV laser engraver. Just so we can parallelize it, but at some point we'll probably set up a laser engraver setup to make all the basic chips necessary for circuits, but we'll see. For now, however, that's it for today's episode. As always, if you have any feedback, we'd love to hear it. We hope you enjoyed!